Hey, welcome, Kelpel. Great hey, to see man. you here. How are yeah, you? Thank you so been much a, for having been, me, dude. Yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, oh, God, how long has it been? <laughs> honestly, it's been it's been basically a year, right? I think you had yeah. me on your stream about a year ago. Yeah, so, something like that. I remember last, what last streaming year. last year. Um, I think Mario Maker. Oh God! That, that was, <laughs> no, no, it, it's fun. It, it's fun. I, I on a, that we had a really nice time. It's it's one of those games that uh, while I wouldn't say it's my cup of tea, just because it's it. I I think for me it's just a little bit too hard. But I absolutely respect the game that everyone's doing. You know, so I think that's honestly very cool. Yeah, definitely want to curate your experiences in Mario Maker because otherwise, like, uh, there's a lot of crazy content out there. But yeah, it is a great it is. game. <laughs> there honestly is. I, re I respect it, honestly. Yeah, so uh, obviously today we're going to be talking about our top five uh, games of 2020 in, in no particular order, of course. And, yeah. and these are games that we played in 2020, not necessarily games that were released in 2020. Um I guess we could just jump in, uh, and then yeah. I could I could do my top five. I could do my I, my first one, and then you could do your next one, and then okay, sure, yeah, sure. and then we could do honorable mentions afterwards. Yeah, let's let's do it, man. I'm down. All right, I'll start with number five. Um, for me, my uh, number five is uh, Slate Aspire. I know it's an older game. Slate Aspire. I don't. Yes. I don't think I know it. Slate Aspire is um, it's a roguelike deck building game. So you basically tech building games. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, this year has been like year of roguelike gaming for me. Like for whatever reason, roguelike games have been my cup of tea. I think it's just that um, I've been working from home a lot, mm -hmm. and so roguelike games are kind of a, a little uh, like nice little distraction. Uh, the games run for you know however long your your run or your session is, right? So you you do a run, and if you fail, you kind of use that as a natural breaking point. Uh, mm -hmm. so for, for Slate Aspire, you basically you get you start out with with a character who has a specific skill set, and that skill set's reflected in, in the cards in your deck. You you start up with about eight cards, I believe, and mm -hmm. you go up a dungeon basically. And every uh, every encounter could be either a random event, uh, actual battle where you use your cards, or it mm -hmm. could be like a boss battle, a super boss. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah, so so every every encounter you basically um, using your cards and your deck um, in whatever order they come out in, trying to find synergies for basically playing your hand as best as possible. And as you progress to the dungeon, you, you get more cards via the events that you encounter. Right, if you get an event where you get you know very mm -hmm. good cards, you can use that and incorporate them into your deck. Sometimes you have events that take away cards, right? So you you having mm -hmm. to adapt to the situation. But basically, okay. in, in all cases, you're looking for synergies that make your your hand as good as as possible. Interesting. And like, yeah, this is a really fun yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because like... usually de deck building games, um, uh, the ones that come to mind, I think, are like uh, Baton Kaitos. Uh, I know that one's like more of an RPG one, but um, I know they can get a little bit complicated when it comes to like learning a deck. So w one thing I am curious, like, is this something that's easier to get into, or like, how would you rate that? Yeah, uh, so Slate Aspire is interesting because it started off like a wave of a lot of deck building roguelite games that came after. Uh, I think they owe like a uh, a debt to, to Slate Aspire because they really really made, they made the deck building concept uh, a lot more digestible, right? So the games the game is obviously shorter than Bian Kaitos, right? Because it's not like a I think there are three dungeons in total if you're doing one run, right? Um, so there's like three dungeons in total, and and each dungeon is about twelve. Or fourteen encounters. I'm sure there's somebody who's oh, listening. Slay who actually... the spire, right? Yeah, slay the spire. Slay the spire. Okay. Yeah, okay. slay the spire. Yeah. Um, I'm sure someone who's listening who actually could correct me on that, but I think there's about twelve encounters per each map. Um, oh, and I so see, okay. within a single run, you're gonna maybe have uh like uh a total of like thirty or forty encounters, right? And okay. so you're building your deck within that short amount of time, and and you, and usually by the time you get to the last level. The last uh, dungeon, you, you probably don't want to edit your deck anymore, right? You, by that point, you should have all the cards you want to use, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's you being, you're building your deck as you're playing the game, and uh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, and yeah. like you, you obviously, um, the, the scope is much smaller, basically. So like it's it's much easier to get into. It's more intuitive. Um, and then a, there's a bunch of games that came after Slate Aspire that really popularized this sort of like bite-sized deck building concept. And obviously, the deck building concept is as old as like 
you know, card games, right? Yeah, Magic it's, the as, it's as old as it's as old as time, as weird as that sounds, but yeah, in, in some way, shape, or form. So I saw that this came out in 2017. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's an older game, but I, I, um, I've, oh, I've had it in my library since like 2019, but I didn't really play it. My, my, mm-hmm. uh, my, my girlfriend was really into it, and then I think this year I just, you know, needed some distractions while I was working from home, and this game was really. That's good. And yeah, it sounds like it's it's easy to get into, easy to get out, so you can just go in, go go out, and yeah, and that's true a... of, of of most like roguelike games. Uh, like most roguelike games are pretty much you do a single run, right? If you have mm-hmm. a really good run, obviously that run could last for hours. But for most people, I think uh, you can have a run, and you usually it ends, especially if you're a new beginner, the, the run ends pretty quickly because you're still learning the ropes. Um, but you take those lessons from your previous runs and you apply them to future runs. Okay, interesting. Huh. Yeah, I might have to check that out because that's cool. I will admit that I do have a tendency to, I guess you can say, back away from, um, how would I say this? Um, from a lot of card games, just because it, like, the card aspect itself seems like an intimidating, um, uh, hurdle to get over. But I, I would like to try this. You know, it seems like something you could get in and out. And I think that's pretty cool to see that. Yeah, um, I, I think too. Like the thing with these new, newer roguelike deck building games is like it, basically everything that you need is 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 within uh, the run that you're going to be doing, right? Mm. Um, and as you play the game, right, you're going to learn what synergies are most effective. But like, uh, for example, when you start Slate Aspire, you have like five attack cards, five def- the defense cards, right? Um, in, in theory, I mean, there are people who beaten the game with just those cards. I mean. Um, but like it's it's really um it's really difficult to like i guess like uh fail one of these games in terms of like the pro- the progression every time you basically every time you 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 lose a run you 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 can unlock new newer cards for you to encounter in future runs mm-hmm. um and like the game basically gives you what you need to do what you need to succeed uh like within the first you know like floor or whatever okay and at the, basically, at the the way you improve is by getting better at recognizing what cards synergize with what cards. But in terms of like, you're gonna always have a, attack cards unless you sell them all for some reason. You're gonna always have defense cards unless you sell them all for some reason, mm-hmm. right? So like, in, in terms of what you need to succeed, like the basics are all there. I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I might have to check that out. That's pretty awesome, man. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I think I have one that you that um that you might want to hear about so um i would say i it's in no particular order but one that comes to mind believe it or not is metal gear solid the first one on pc have you played it this year yeah so he, so here's an interesting story um on on my youtube channel i do a series called port versus port which compares vanilla versions of games with um different ports of it and the reason that i'm mentioning this one specifically in 20 20 is because the pc port actually came out on gog on 2020 oh that's interesting yeah you know what? i uh <laughs> i actually have a, a bootleg copy of um i probably shouldn't be saying this on my channel right someone's gonna come knocking at my door <laughs> but i i, I downloaded it to back when i was um i think i was like um probably 12 i downloaded uh i for some somehow i found a, a copy of, of the pc port of, of metal gear solid floating on the internet for both yeah, the first it, it, and the second game I know it's yeah, very old, were, but yeah. No, those two were those two were floating around, and I'm going to talk about this too because I was genuinely pleasantly surprised how these run. So these are official Konami releases. You can get them right now on GOG for um, nine ninety nine, so ten bucks. Uh, I okay. don't know if they're on a discount. I remember um, for Christmas they were. I'll I'll check now if, while I'm saying this, but um. It's very cool. You know, they definitely optimize the game to run easy on Windows 10. So you don't have to fiddle with anything. You don't have to mess with anything. Uh, The game is presented in an original 4 by 3 aspect ratio. But what's cool, it can be modded to take a full 1080p. Or if you really want to, I have a widescreen ultra wide monitor. And it takes full advantage of that. And you can take advantage of 4K, whatever resolution of your monitor. Which is pretty cool. You can't really do that natively. But you can you can do that, which is very nice. Um, instant saves. Uh, oh, wow. Instant, instant loads. Yeah, you don't need to use mailing for that. So instant saves, instant loads. Um, 
it runs pretty smoothly. If you use the mod, it's, you know, viewer discretion is advised kind of thing where, right. um, you know, your experience will vary, but it is very cool to see that I played it. Uh, it takes native controllers. So as soon as you plug in a controller, it's good. Uh, button remapping. Um, it, it's quite good, actually. Holy shit. I, yeah, I, I would, like, no, um, yeah, yeah. That's like some really quality care because there are a lot of retro titles, and I, I it, it's crazy to say that 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 uh, no, you're right. a retro title, but I mean it is. It's at this point, it's like <laughs> twenty years old. Um, like it to see a, a title that old get that this much love and care from its creator is is it's, uh, it's really surprising. It's yeah. more GOG. It's more GOG it's, itself. Okay, it's more, okay, okay. Than it's not anything. Con- okay, yeah. yeah. It's not Konami necessarily. I wouldn't say so. I think they just probably got the licensing mm-hmm. and they were able to do that, but they made their own wrapper. They made their own um, UI that makes it uh, pretty easy. And the best part is that it it includes uh, the VR missions too. So Oh, well, you're... yeah. That was a separate program, right? Because when I downloaded the, the Metal Gear mm-hmm. Solid one, uh, the VR missions, I had to find a separate like download for that. Interesting, because um, usually when you got Integral, the original... PC ported this back in 1999. Um, it had VR missions included into it. Yeah, no, I mean, very... it, it launches the VR missions from the from the same program, but like it's it's like it's 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 like a standalone program for some reason. Yeah, like... it is a standalone EX. Oh, okay, sure. okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's how it works. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and um, the same. I haven't checked that out too much yet, but uh, you know, Metal Gear Solid Two, uh, yeah, Metal Gear Solid Two has been released as well on GOG. Uh, so I guess you can call that a little honorable mention, right? But um, with a little mod, you can also take it full advantage of your screen. Um, you know, obviously, keep in mind some things won't scale properly. Right, the whole right. codec scenes, it doesn't look as good. The font isn't as strong as it could be. I'm sure uh, somebody's it, modded all this though. <laughs> like, yeah, um, uh, some fan so, mods maybe. Yeah, so I I haven't like fully delved into the mods. The only one I did was a resolution one to kind of take mm-hmm. full advantage of my monitor but it's i would it's definitely a nice spin on an old classic that you can play that is different from playing it on any playstation family consoles right so it that's i actually do give that a good recommendation that was a fun not only a fun video to make but to talk about i was pleasantly surprised yeah it sounds pretty good yeah Yeah. absolutely recommend that uh, honestly, if if we can get all retro titles to get that kind of experience, game preservation might be, um, like the 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 dream of having every game preserved might be realized, right? Yeah. So that's that's honestly another conversation because I could. I know I don't want to go into like because I was no, talking no, about that with with uh, with E on um, Nintendo yeah. and stuff. So, so <laughs> I, I I will say that um, when it comes to preservation and accessibility, uh, I feel like companies do have a responsibility to do as much as they can because if they won't take hands into it, then their fans will. But then that goes into you know voiding or uh, infringing upon co- copyright um, yeah, copyrights, exactly. which exactly. Which is very, very true. Company can take every right legally, but right. I think morally and in the aspect of, you know, people who are very appreciative. I think that's that's the biggest word. They're very appreciative of this medium, and they want to make sure that it takes, uh, it takes care. You know, there's plenty of um, developers and modders out there who are, quite honestly, taking Nintendo sixty four disc drive. Um, games trying to preserve them some of them unfortunate failed discs and lost in time but like last year uh superman 64 for the playstation one actually leaked well i want to say leaked but um right uh someone who had the prototype actually mm-hmm. released that to the public uh there was the mcdonald's game uh for the nintendo ds that was uh finally dumped for the public which was a very very lovely thing to see um there was a lot of pretty cool preservation so long story short uh, I feel companies have responsibility to have preservation, and obviously, you know, people are willing to pay for us. It's not like they're not, but you yeah, know, give us that no, option. Uh, what right, can we do in that? That that's exactly what leads to emulation. Like that's exactly like, what exactly. we were talking about with uh, with Elwood. Yeah, um, it's exactly. I I wish we lived in that world where where companies realize that because I think it could be a win win. Right, people are willing to pay for thirty year old titles because uh, they yeah. have new, newer hardware. Uh, <laughs> and, and I, I think the Nintendo, um, what is it called? Uh, the Super Mario, uh, Super Mario 3D All Stars, which 
Um, I had some complaints, but they have definitely fixed a couple things, which I'm, which I'm pleasantly happy about. Yeah, I did notice that, especially with the inverted controls and and stuff like that mm-hmm. for the GameCube controller. It's, qu- um, it's quite a, it's quite a big deal. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. knock on wood, they actually release a real virtual console. But uh, until then, uh, I guess I won't hold my breath. Yeah, it, I I could I could go into why that's kind of the case and why I feel that is the case that they made it such limited release. Yeah, I but... we I kind of speculated on that with Elwood. Um, I I think I mean I think there are many reasons why they did it, um, and I, and I know they can get away with it. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, though, that they do something like a virtual console at some point. Yeah. It might. It, it seems some people are speculating that they are actually are going to do a virtual console, but mm-hmm. and that's and that's why the limited releases were a thing. Um, it it sounds plausible, but we'll have to kind of wait and see. I I I feel like I do doubt that because, um, while not only making this limited, it it will be delisted off of eShop later this year. I probably will say about March, I think, is when they said that. The yeah, March was. March 31st. I think it's, if so, it lines up at the end of the fiscal year. So it unfortunately will be delisted. Which yeah, is... some, people, some people are saying like it'll be it'll be delisted from like the 3D All-Stars will be delisted, but they're saying the individual titles are somehow going to appear in Virtual Console. That is going to be... See, yeah. That, I don't that's think, a I don't, I don't know how much weight I put behind it, but I mean, it, it sounds like it could happen, but I... It, I don't know exactly if I put a lot of weight on the evidence people are, are suggesting. You know, uh, when, when it comes to this, I would love to be wrong. And I, I, would, yeah, I would love to eat my own words when it comes into this. I really it'd would. It'd be a perfect world if, if that's exactly what happens. It truly would. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I feel like I took too much time. No, it's fine. This. Let's. So uh, what would you say is your next game that you're pretty excited for? I probably should have re- reversed the order. Uh, so the, the next game is is uh, Tyranny. Uh, Tyranny is a game by Paradox Games. It's a, it's a um, real-time role-playing game, um, similar to, oh, like, so... Pillars of Eternity. Yeah. Um, the... I'm a sucker for RTSs, so... Yeah, yeah. It, it's, 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 like, it's, it's closer to an RPG than, than a real-time strategy, but, like, it's not turn-based, if that makes sense. It so definitely like, has. It definitely has. Just because I'm looking this up right now, it has an isometric feel. Mm-hmm. So I, it definitely it, reminds me of like older school uh, Planescape Torment, Baldur's it is, Gate, it is meant to be, Yeah, it's meant exactly. It's exactly in that tradition. Um, uh, Paradox specifically made uh, Pillars of Eternity, which I don't know if you're familiar with that series, but like that's no. like. Um, yeah, I mean, they're all meant to be like. So they all stem from tabletop RPGs, obviously, right? But it, yeah, it is yeah, yeah. it is exactly in the same vein of the, the older titles you just listed, right? It's meant to mm-hmm. be uh, like that feel. I mean, tyranny's tyranny's re- revolution is not necessarily the the um, the like battle format, right? It's not like the the gameplay. It's actually um, the story lets you role play as like a um, like a a like uh, you're called um, the fate binder. It's basically like a, a legal servant for this this empire that's that's like taking over these colonies. And uh, the role playing element involves like a lot of moral aspects. So like it's it's one of the most okay, I think morally yeah. complex, uh, morally complex role playing games uh, uh, that I've I've kind of kind of played. And I I, uh, I finished I, the, I, I'm the Mass Effect. What I'm hearing. Yeah, I finished the Mass Effect trilogy last year. So like obviously I think this Ooh. is like this is phenomenally more engaging in that, and not in terms of the cinematics or the gameplay, but in terms of the choices that you can make. They're they're all hard choices, honestly. Like there's really it's like it's like you know in these RPGs where you get to play as 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 good of a guy as you want to be, right? It's really easy mm-hmm. to be the good guy, and, and it's like sort of like uh, escapism kind of fantasy. This yeah. is more this is more of a deliberative kind of uh, role playing where you're like making hard choices, like hard and fast choices, and it's like it's really um, it's really an experience trying to you know playing through this this uh this world honestly i'm quite honestly glad that you mentioned this because um there and i I apologize if i deviate a bit but i do know what you mean in this um one of the games that i played last year that i just got was planescape torment and i played that for maybe about five hours i regret to say that i haven't played as much as i'd like to but from what i played i'm noticing this kind of genre is incredibly detailed where it lacks in maybe some gameplay elements. Yep. It it 
absolutely picks up and the story, world building world yeah. building yeah. character building and setting everything up and honestly they're probably some of the most incredibly diverse uh places and engaging stories i've ever played yeah more so and so detailed too i think i remember there was a paragraph long almost introducing each setting so let's say you speak to a character it it describes it as you see a a decrepit old woman dressed in a a you know parched burlap sack you know covered in dried blood and and already that that already you know um evokes something right beautiful that you that your mind is already working and i really appreciate these games because they don't dumb it down for the player and i think that's something that i i appreciate when a game doesn't dumb its story down or degrade what it knows for a better experience for the player and i think that's a very cool experience yeah, it's very. It allows you to have a, like a more, I think, like a more unique experience to the world. Honestly, it does. Um, and it like it, it may not be as a direct as a power fantasy as say like Skyrim or uh, Mass Effect mm-hmm. or whatever, right? But uh, in, in the same way, uh, it's it's closer to like the experiences you'd have with a really good novel. And I yeah, think that I like, would agree. I think Absolutely. a game that can do that is is um, it's, it's a it's a very powerful game. It's a very powerful. You, it's not something that you see often, and I think it kind of leads itself towards a uh, someone's personal cup of tea because yeah. not not every person is willing to be that immersed. Sometimes you know you just want to play a game that kind of feeds the story to you, which I'm not trying to say it as a bad way, but sometimes right. you want a game that feeds the story to you, and I think that's fine. But there is something special about these tabletop RPGs or these games that you know are very derivative derivative of Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. but really exceed expectations when it comes into story. It's something you don't see very often. Yeah, I, I, I think especially it's, today too. I think it's the 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 genre, um, the the medium. I think is more unique than say like a first person or a, thir- a third person yeah. role playing game. I think there's some things that that are kind of afforded to these these isometric like tabletop style games that that just um it's it's just harder to replicate. And these uh, the other thing too is like when you make a you know a triple A title that um that has you know uh this this first person perspective, um like it, you're going for a different feel anyway, right? Like when you're creating mm-hmm. uh you know a Skyrim, you're not going for this kind of feel directly at least. Um, no, you, no you want the player to actually feel you know like if they want to make you know easy moral choices or or if they want to avoid certain types of conflict you want it to be uh more readily available to them right whereas think... in the, in this story like in, in tyranny right you're you're thrusted into a role you don't really have any choice about it right it's it's about you making the best of of a bad situation and, yeah. and and role playing it from that way, right? Instead of kind of role playing as a kind of a, a free renegade agent doing whatever they want. I th- I think definitely uh, the name of the game is seeing <laughs> yeah. with your mind. No, it's seeing, yeah. no, it's seeing with your mind. Yeah. yeah instead yeah. of seeing with your eyes, I think yeah. that's something that a lot of games do. They're they're very visually pleasing and rightfully so. But with games like these, they do just enough where it keeps your eyes guessing but even more to open your mind. And that's something you don't see often. Um, I think even a great example of that, I was recently replaying Fallout New Vegas, and I was just still stunned with how, yeah, the whole game is very visually stunning, but how well-written each character is and um, how immersed you get into each side quest and everything. And when a game does that really nicely, it's it's special. You don't see that that often. I really don't. Yeah, that's definitely so, true. And that's a good know, distinction too. Seeing with your eyes versus seeing with your mind. I I think so. And that's yeah. that's what that's what we're we're used to seeing with our eyes these days. That's, that's kind of yeah. Good. That's what the industry is kind of trending towards, or what it's been trending for towards, for like for the last like uh ten plus years. Yeah, I I I'd, I'd actually say so completely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not that it's bad. It's just it's just a, no, a difference. No. Yeah. No. If how about this? If you want me to break the ice, I'll do this. One of my favorite games of 2020. 
uh, was Doom Eternal. <laughs> I, there you go. If you want a game where you see with your eyes, that's it's a lot of seeing with your eyes. <laughs> It, it a really lot of is. I can't. Yeah, I mean, it's a gorgeous game, honestly. I I played it from start to finish. I played it on Ultra Nightmare on uh on PS4. I would have liked to play it on PC, but yeah. I, I personally want to wait until it's like extremely cheap on Steam sale, and then I'll pick it up. Yeah. But I was absolutely blown away. There is, it it's just incredible. Um, the story is really well done. They've I'm not going to spoil it, but yeah, if yeah. if you are a Doom fan and you, and you appreciate the classic, the classics, uh, not only story wise is this very well done, and you'll get a huge kick out of it. Right. But I think you'll really enjoy the gameplay. It's different from the original Dooms because what what it is, it's more, it's definitely more reminiscent of Quake. So if uh you can't keep you can't stay in one place, obviously. But um, you basically are in an arena, usually, and just kind of uh, defeating a bunch of, you know, enemies in one specific area and moving on to the next. And it sounds very, very tame, but um, they definitely up the game. So you feel um, the guns punch in so much power. You yeah. know, you, you start with an assault rifle, and the assault rifle does quite a lot. And then you move on to the shotgun. And... Each weapon feels beefy. It feels rough and angry. And you combine that with probably one of the greatest tracks that you'll hear. And that whole situation is very interesting with the composer, uh, Mike, uh, Mike Gordon, who's an absolute genius when he did his composition. With some of the tracks, not all of them, there's, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but it's, it's very interesting. But... Um, it's just really well done from start to finish. Um, I would definitely say it was one of the best games this year, if not probably game of the year, just because just each level was absolutely curated. Any problem that you've had with Doom 2016 is completely remedied in Doom Eternal. Um, it, you know, bringing beautiful hallmarks to the original. Uh, it's just not only faithful, it's definitely a new generation of Doom. And I think anyone who who is even remotely an FPS fan, this is probably the best first-person shooter you will ever play, period. It, it's unbelievable. It really is. Sounds awesome. You should, be, uh, you should be an advertiser for uh, the folks at um, <laughs> Bethesda now that, 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 that publishes Doom. Yeah, yeah, they did. Definitely they do. Um no, I I I love the game. I picked it up on launch. It was it's it's stellar. It really is. I, I can't recommend it enough. I yeah, really I'm can. like I think I finally have a setup that I can really, really take in all the eye candy with. Uh so That's right. You mentioned that you were getting a new computer, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just built it a few days ago, so it's pretty pretty exciting. Well, um, oh, okay. Um what are your what are your specs, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, so I got a 3080 with a 5600X. Um, like so, it's a Ryzen Ryzen 5000 plus a, a NVIDIA like, uh, 3000 yeah, GPU. So yeah, I mean, damn, basically, I it. yeah, top of the line. <laughs> how, how were you able to get? Were, were, how were you able to get a, a 3000? Like, were they able? Did you get them no, I, when they come out? No, I I um I, I I bought it from someone locally. So it's like I got it for like about 200 above MSRP. I I don't I don't damn. recommend doing that, but like. No, I wanted to. I, yeah, I wanted to build it by Christmas, so I just said, "Fuck it." That's fair. It's. Yeah. I mean, to be quite honest, you're going to be playing probably top I'm, of the line. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not planning on upgrading for a while, so I don't really consider it like a you know a loss or anything. No, no, no. You, yeah, I can. I can absolutely agree that you'll probably have a good eight years with this because it's. I mean, a thirty eighty technically right now. Um. I mean, you're definitely delving into 4K territory. Yeah, and you you can you can do a lot with that. Even even if you really want to push it 8K, but that's that's it's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a, I've been excited to dive in. I'm still downloading some stuff from my library, but uh, in a bit I'll be <laughs> in gaming heaven. Oh, you you gotta let me know how how that is. I'm very excited to hear from you. <laughs> yep, yep. 
So what what do you feel is your next game? No, I feel kind of kind of weird because I've been talking about games that are not like pushing any of my hardware. <laughs> but <laughs> you don't need be games fair, to push your hardware to have a great time. No, that's something that's, that I that's very true. And like to be fair, obviously I just got this stuff. So some of the games we'll be playing later this year will be like obviously like newer like titles that are going to be more demanding. Mm-hmm. But um, like like I said, this year on my older laptop, I've just been kind of doing uh gaming sessions between like work and stuff so Mm -hmm. a lot of the games have been these roguelike games like so with that in mind like uh the next game on my list is called noita uh it's finished for witch yeah it's a pixel art game that came out in early access in 2019 like this like last year actually around this time early access it was released this year the final version in october of this year so um noita is I have a very um, interesting relationship with Noida. I'm definitely There's... getting Metroidvania vibes. Yeah, well, kind of. Uh, I'll explain. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll explain it in a bit. But like, the, my relationship with Noida, I think, was very, very well summed up by this this uh, this meme on the subreddit for Noida. It was like uh, a meme of like someone's like like smiling, and one one part of the meme is like you know like. When I think about Noida, it's like this person's smiling, and then when I like actually play Noida, and it's like a frown face. <laughs> oh my god, it's actually one of those. And Noida is a very hard game. Yeah. Um. Oh, so okay. Noida, yeah, Noida is supposed to be. When I use the term rogue like, I think Noida is actually in the in the list of games I've said so far. Noida is the most like rogue, in that there's it's ex, ex, exploration heavy. So that's the mm-hmm. Metroidvania aspect you're talking about. Um, yeah. But not only is the exploration heavy, there are a lot of secrets that the developers put in the game that, like, I think only, like, maybe 3% of the gaming population has discovered, right? Like, I think there are, there are some YouTubers who specifically only play Noida and maybe a few other games, but Noida is, like, the thing they play the most. They have, like, 900 hours in Noida, and even they're discovering stuff in this game, I swear, mm-hmm. that, like, no one else has discovered. Um, and you don't need those secrets to, to beat the game, right? But... It just goes to the level of detail that went into this game is just insane. So the the main premise of Noida is that you're a witch, um, as the name applies in Finnish, and like you are basically trying to get to the end of the world uh, that you are you're in. You get the spawned. end of the world. Okay. Well, the end of the world is in like the location. It's like a location. And you're trying to get to the works is like a a place at the bottom of the world. That's actually one of the endings there's a bunch of other objectives that exist in the world that you have to discover if you're going to do all the secret hunting but the main the main run that 99 percent of people are going to be trying to accomplish is getting to the works which is like mm-hmm. at the bottom of the world um and like the world is procedurally generated right so like it's it's entirely um uh, random i mean like the layout is the same so like the the first the first part of the world you spawn in is usually always the same it's like a little grassy area and then you go into the mines, and then from the mines you go into like the you know deeper levels like the, like the uh, coal pits, and then the jungle, etc. Um, mm. So like, but the the way the the enemy layouts are procedurally generated, the items that spawn are procedurally generated, like the tiles that, ju- that spawn are procedurally generated, right? So there's a lot of like um, randomness in terms of like you're gonna have a different play t- play play, um, play like like a different experience every time you play the game. It's actually so procedurally generated that in the the version one patch, when the game actually left early access, they started randomizing your loading load your loading uh, your starting layout, which wow. pe- people were kind of so, mad about because like before in the I can era, get why yeah in early access you used to spawn with a a, a water like flask and I'll explain why that's important in a few seconds, but uh, after the version one launch they started randomizing what flask you start with, so like yeah Noida. Yeah. No, in, no, in Noida, like every particle in the world is like the physics are simulated. So, like mm-hmm. for example, if you like, if you, you you're you're a witch, you have a wand, right? Say you you cause a little spark of fire on the grass, that fire will spread across the world based on the basis of like how much grass there is there and like um, how much is feeding the fire, right? And then that that fire can actually get on your clothing and then cause you to have like a uh, damage over time, so you can catch on fire, right? And then, like, there are other types of, like, you know, real-world elements in the world. Like, oil is, exists, right? And, and then oil and water physics are roughly proportional to what oil and water do in the real world, right? So, mm-hmm. like, 
you could have scenarios in which like you can use this knowledge of of you know of you know basic you know like uh interactions to to actually attack enemies with right if you see like a, a puddle of like oil right and you have like a, a fire like flask or whatever you could you could use that there's also also like a bunch of uh, simulated chemicals like a uh, berserkium is like a type of thing that exists in noida that's quite cool causes, causes enemies to go berserk right so like there's a lot of like um I don't want to say like strategizing, but there's a lot of like uh, using this applied knowledge in order to progress uh, further and further. Mm-hmm. Um, but also because of that, the game is is some people consider it like unreasonably hard, uh, and I, I'm I'm not necessarily one of those. But I I'm happy to admit I've never beaten the game. But I it's a game that's like despite that is so it's a lot to take in. It's it's really it's really enjoyable. Like it's just like that's good to the, hear. The amount of, of of detail, you know, that, that goes into this game or that it went to this game, is is just impressive. Um, when all these things interacted together, it's just interesting to see that. And when you have this knowledge of the game, you can, um, you, it's it's just it's really impressive to like Im- apply that knowledge and get further than you did last time. And it's I haven't definitely, even, yeah, it, it's definitely one of those games where it sounds like when you're playing it that, um, uh that you can get over the hurdle. If you try hard, you can get over the hurdle. So it's a difficulty that it can be tough, but if you apply yourself, you can you can make it through. Yeah, I think so. It's just that some people argue that some of the mechanics are, are unreasonably yeah. cryptic. I think it can be R it can be RNG based and when something is usually out of your control, that's when it's a problem. That's why people don't like it. And I and rightfully so. You know? Yeah. Like they're they're not wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can go on and on about Noida. The, the cool thing too is Noida has a Steam Mod Workshop support. So like, uh, my experience has been different because I've been playing with a lot of mods. I think the the base game is fun, but honestly, the base game can be kind of frustrating. So I've installed some mods that like uh, expand some of the mechanics in the game, um, and I, I also have mods that uh, increase the number of elements that exist in the world, so I can I can have more interactions. Um, there's some wands, for example, that are unique to mods. Um, the wand building is also something that's interesting in both the base game and in the mod world. So, yeah, Noida just has that's a lot cool. of stuff to play with. It's just it's a really it's a really fun experience. I wouldn't recommend buying it at full price, but like if you are into sort of exploration based games with, you know, I guess Metrovania is a fair fair title. I think the one mm-hmm. thing that makes it not Metrovania is that like the uh, the biomes in the Noida world aren't very well connected. So when you backtrack, you literally have oh. to like. Fly. Yeah, someone made a mod, though, that actually makes them more connected. So if you want to play, like, Metrovania, there's actually a Metrovania mod from Noida if you, like, want that more. But the game does encourage you to backtrack. It's just that it's not very easy, too, <laughs> in the base game. Interesting. That's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see. What is another game? Um. I will say it. it's really done with a lot of love and care. And you. it's probably not surprising to hear, but Animal Crossing, for sure. The newest Animal Crossing is yeah, um, definitely one of the top ones. Um, I will say with my experience of Animal Crossing, I've only played the previous one, New Leaf, and I've mm-hmm. played this one. I played a little bit of the GameCube recently, actually recently. Right. But um, what's really nice is that it's obviously, it's one of those, like personally, it's one of those games that was helpful during COVID to connect with people. Um, and I really appreciated that a lot that I was able to have that, but on top of that, um, it's just a wonderful title. That's just that it's, it, it, it just grows with you and, um, to create your own character and make your own Island. A lot of the, um, abilities to make your own Island really are quite impressive crafting to the building degree. Um, and there are constant updates too. So like yesterday, for example, I was playing Animal Crossing with my girlfriend, uh, watching the countdown of New Year's. And, you know, we both celebrated New Year's in Animal Crossing and with the people that we were with. And I thought that was really cool. It's a game that definitely grows with you. And it's it's been getting better over time with a little bit of free updates. So, um, well, a lot of people are like, maybe this one is a slightly watered down one from previous Animal Crossings. I think they're definitely making it up with seasonal updates and they're quite frequent. So yeah. that's 
that's very nice to to see that they are taking that like nice uh nice bits of care and i can really i can stand behind that you know the cool thing with the switch is that like unlike uh, older and earlier um like game consoles nintendo you know because it's, it's an online based console they can update yeah. their games almost like a games as, as a service without necessarily the, the sleazy like microtransaction aspects of it right like if animal crossing is going to get like quality of care improvements throughout for the entirety of the switch's life or maybe even you know maybe two more years or whatever like that's that's pretty good value um, it, it, it is because you pay 60 dollars and there's still more coming in and all of those are free updates and they're they're quite good too like for example people were complaining there weren't any food items and now they added quite a bit of food items now and um you know they increase your storage now there's accounts um backups you can transfer to new switch so a lot of the updates that people have been asking for have been done over time and it's not like it's one of those games where it's um they they finished using dlc updates like i don't know cyberpunk which is another story (laughs) in itself i get we could talk about that (laughs) we could talk about that yeah Um, but but um you can tell they, they they put their care into it it's not like they have. They really loved what they were doing. No, that's what I was saying. Like, I think like the, the modern gaming is kind of moved towards like you know the, the as a service model. Um, but like that's that's why these games are getting updates and that's why they're being managed and stuff. And the servers that they're they're running on are maintained, right? Um, but the upside with some of these Nintendo titles is like you know like the sleazy aspects of that model they don't really exist, right? There are no microtransactions directly in Smash Bros or animal mm-hmm. crossing but yet you know the games are getting patched like uh they're being they're being cared for they're being made they're being cared for and because things will happen here and there i understand that yeah not every game can you know can ship without perfectly bugs. yeah I mean, or without without bugs or even necessarily quality of life changes right there might be things that like make sense for the developers to add right if it's yeah you know, whether it's character, character balance in smash bros or new features and new leaf right like I think that like I think the fact that we are getting we're living in an era where that, that can happen I think is a, is a great thing you know I just yeah it is I just wish that the rest of the industry would kind of avoid the sleazy practices that they could tack on with that you know if they're doing it as a service model they also have microtransactions and other things that are not really as uh, favorable. It's definitely being used more these days as a crutch rather than an actual you know addition to what you have made. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know. I mean, we we can touch this a little bit if you, if you would like, but um, the whole cyberpunk aspect really is one of those things where uh, the game hasn't been finished, but they decided to develop it through updates that shouldn't even be done, but right, due to they, trying to meet deadlines and trying yeah. to make as much money quicker, that's a lot on top of um, unethical practices to... Uh, pushing your employees forward and that's also a very right. sad practice as to, well to no avail right obviously like it, yeah it, yeah it, it cramming in all the development time clearly didn't allow them to produce their best work so it didn't even in the end work out for them uh yeah, <laughs> yeah the reason why i bring up microtransactions and stuff is because i was thinking of games like avengers right they, they literally oh ran... i haven't heard too much about it and that's not usually a good thing no, oh well, yeah, I mean the it's the the story of of Avengers is actually I think it's it was basically kind of eerily similar to Cyberpunk. I mean, obviously Cyberpunk is in a better state, and I think Cyberpunk is going to overall be in a better state mm-hmm. than when when the, when the dust settles. But in terms of the you know the the unfulfilled promises, the hyped expectations, it, it's a similar story arc. I mean, not to the yeah. same degree, right? Because no one was was waiting for years and years for Avengers, right? But a, a lot of people had had a similar kind of faith that, uh, you know, um, uh, Crystal Dynamics could deliver a hype title, um, and they didn't. And the game, yeah. launched, the game launched buggy. The game crashed all the time when it launched. Um, I think the, thing, the extra thing that killed it is that they, um, in an interesting move, it readily embraces games as a service model that I'm talking about. But instead of you know the service being we're going to update your game and care for it, it's more like you you pay us you know microtransactions and in theory all your DLC in the future will be completely free. Um, 
but honestly, in most cases, I don't, I mean, a lot of the people who were waiting for this title, they, they readily believe that, you know, like, you know, oh, we're going we're gonna to get free DLC because, you know, all the money from the microtransactions will pay for the development time for all these other things. No. But no, yeah, no, they, I mean, usually in the industry, when they do microtransactions, it's, it's just a cash grab. You know, the money yeah, goes just simply money, enough. That's money right. goes into the pockets of whoever invested in the game. The money, I, the, I, the stockholders. And right. I, 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 I don't really think that the, the microtransactions are needed to finance uh, development. And you look at games like, uh, this is kind of a spoiler for my list, but Ghost of Tsushima. They, oh, Ghost of Tsushima is amazing from what I've heard. I mean, I like, have not had the it, they, they, um, you know, they released new content without having to have microtransactions in the game. Yeah. They released a whole new mode, actually, with with some new assets. Multiplayer. Mo- exactly. I, I, so this this idea that we need microtransactions to finance development uh, <laughs> is kind of yeah. Yeah, I mean, games as a service, I think, can be done right. And I think Nintendo and uh, Sucker Punch have shown that you can have service updates for a game that is currently, you know, actively played without meeting all these other sleazy practices. I I didn't mean to go on a soapbox, but I it just came up since you brought up Animal Crossing being so well well cared for. Yeah, it was very well cared for. It still is. Yeah. So that makes me very very happy. Honestly, so I I would definitely recommend that. It's it's a game that will last few years, as all Animal Crossing games do. Yeah, unsurprisingly. So my next game is actually uh, another roguelike game. I I really got into these this year, as I said. Uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, called One Step from Eden, and it actually came out this year. It came out I think in March of this year. Mm-hmm. It, this year has been so freaking long. I actually lost track of time. I, I don't know when it came out. It came out. In a lot spring. of us have, so you're not. Doing that, <laughs> I said this year as in this year. I mean, 2020 was a long year, and hopefully 2021 yeah. won't be a long year. But <laughs> you and me both. But um, one step from Eden is. Um, I mean, the reason why it's it's uh, on my 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 top list is because. Um, have you played Mega Man Battle Network? No, I actually. Well, I have Battle Transmission on my GameCube, but I actually don't have the Battle Network games, quite surprisingly. Yeah, so One Step for Eden is is exactly designed to be a Mega Man Battle Network like game. Um, the story, obviously, and the characters are di- completely different. The genre of the story is not the same, uh, but like the battle system is one hundred percent Mega Man Battle Network. Um, the thing is, obviously, they've included some new stuff. A lot of the stuff that's new is like roguelike elements. So mm-hmm. similar to uh, Slate Aspire, you, you got like a dungeon kind of crawler where every uh, every encounter is like represented on a map, and you can just select which uh, which encounter you go to, whether it's like a like a shop or like a, a battle or whatever. And mm-hmm. like in 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 battle, the gameplay is is basically Mega Man Battle Network. Um, there are a few differences. Like there's no um, there's no Mega Man Battle Network had like these turns where you could kind of take a break take a breather you could like the game would pause and you could select Mm. which cards you're going to use in your next round uh one step from eden is like never putting on the brakes at all like it's like a faster paced version of Mega Man battle network i think in my review on steam i was just like uh didn't know i wanted Mega Man battle network on crack 10 out of 10 (laughs) this game is really fast paced it's like uh if you if you grew up playing battle network then this game is sort of like the next level of Battle Network, if that makes That's sense. That's kind of cool, actually. Yeah, so That's it's like, for cool. people who, ha- who are looking for that similar gameplay to continue that level of, of intensity to even mm-hmm. go a bit bur- a bit further than they had before as, as players of Battle Network, this game definitely is like a challenging experience even for people who have played Mega Man Battle Network. Um, I'm big in that. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, for that reason alone, it was just a top top of my list. But also being a roguelike game means that I, I could uh, play between work sessions or whatever um so it was a pretty fun experience playing this one this year yeah i'm glad honestly um i guess i should say my next one um i mean this one did come out this year uh it's probably on a lot of people's list but i when i did play it i did enjoy it uh that was phasmophobia actually um you probably a lot of people are talking about yeah i've heard of it but I, i haven't i really followed it okay so i've actually streamed this quite a lot too and I, it's genuinely fun to watch. So basically how the game works, um, 
uh, my girlfriend gift this this and we play this and it's a learning curve but once you really figure out what it is it's it's tons of fun um it's a co-op horror game where you go in and you do a lot of ghost hunting you play with uh four other people which is highly recommended that way you get the full effect um the game is always listening to you when you're playing so the ghosts have to try to find you and technically kill you uh, the point of the game is to try to discover what the ghost is. And once you, you know, discover what it truly is, you know, you leave the premise. So depending on the difficulty, you know, the higher the difficulty that you go, uh, it immediately starts. Or let's say if you're on easier difficulties, you have a five minute time limit to prepare uh, the house and search everything and search for clues. You know, maybe there are like fingerprints going on or there are... Um, you know, maybe some a moment you hear like the car horn going on and the ghost is behind you and you can hear him behind you. Right. You know, it's it's quite amazing to see uh, what they did. And the, the game is still being developed. But uh, I think when it came out, it was quite good. But now it should be even better. It's they did a great job with it. And for an indie team, I think it's. It's wonderful. There's a reason why it caught on. I think one for the pandemic, two came out at a nice time, and three, it's it's pretty good. It's definitely, it's one of it's a very enjoyable horror game if you have it with people. It's worth it for sure. Right. So it it gets my recommendation for sure. Sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah, and then for me, uh, I think my like last major title is uh, I alluded to Ghost of Tsushima. It's a uh, really oh, so you have oh nice. Yeah, actually, it's one of the games that that finally convinced me to to get a PS4. And I know like PS5 is coming out this year, but I figured you know with PS5 being a newer console, mm-hmm. usually a lot of the initial launches are not necessarily the, the smoothest. Like I remember when uh, Xbox. No, they're not. When Xbox 360 launched, you know, there's that red ring of death. Like, I I think that some of the kinks will be worked out. Like, the successive console launches have been relatively smoother, but you usually see, you know, mid mid cycle, these mid cycle console updates, like the uh, PS4 Pro, for example, Mm -hmm. being, being, like, substantially better than, like, the base PS4. Um, So I figure, you know, like, I could wait a few years for if I really want a PS5. Yeah um for a, P- a mid console update um the other thing too is i think i don't really imagine there being a ton of titles that i would be interested in for the ps5 it's just that there's a lot of titles for the ps4 that i was interested in and Ghost yeah Ghost of tsushima was was one of them and, and it is the one that kind of tipped oh, the tip, tipped the balance for me in terms of of actually getting uh the console uh and the game is um i don't want to say the game is is groundbreaking in terms of of gameplay because I think I think it's a it's just a, another successor of of the open world format that's been kind of uh, popularized by Ubisoft, like as a, a mm-hmm. map that's the kind whole of literally... Assassin's Creed, Assassin's Creed stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, like there's a map littered with, with stuff and, and and icons and whatnot. Um, but I think the story, the the cohesiveness of the story, is it's it's just so good. Um, in terms of like that's very and, good to hear. Every element of the world serves a purpose in the story, and it, it's it's really impressive. Like for example, you could be you know walking down the road or whatever, and like a, a little like yellow bird will pop out, right? And and like you eventually learn that those yellow birds are actually they they can guide you to um like like locations without you mm-hmm. necessarily needing to look at your map or or even uh, set a waypoint or whatever, right? Um. There's other other aspects of the environment that that do that serve similar purposes, mm-hmm. um, and then of course there's like the uh, thematic elements of the story itself. You being in in, in uh, 13th century Japan and having uh, these these broader themes of like honor versus uh, you know I- effectiveness, right? You're debating whether or not you could uh, use you should use self against the Mongols or or fight them honorably like a samurai. Um, I do think that there's like uh, some missed opportunities for for integrating that story motif into the gameplay itself like when mm. i when i bought the game i initially thought that you would be punished for using stealth but the game actually uh doesn't really there's no like 
you know, I, I guess it'd be kind of simplistic, but it's like, for example, no morality meter, like whether or not you use stealth or not, it doesn't really matter. It's Every, rare to have a game that punishes that punishes you using stealth. Yeah, that's true. But the thing is, in the story, the story, everyone basically like reprimands you for doing it because like you're supposed to be a samurai who fights honorably, who like is is uh, bold and, and they defeat evil, you know, in broad daylight as opposed to like sneaking around the shadows and kind of stabbing people in the back. Mm -hmm. um so you would think that with that kind of story like that story theme you, you would have uh, actual tension between whether or not you should use the gameplay mechanics but since everyone treats you exactly the same regardless of what you do there's really no point in not using stealth uh, there could be like you know if the game incentivizes you in certain ways you could arguably have a more complex game in which like you have diff different play styles emerge because oh hey i wanted the benefits that would, would, would come from not using stealth, right? But the game doesn't doesn't go into that level of detail. It's not worse for it, but I think I think it is a missed opportunity. But but mm. the package that we got, I think, is still pretty solid, and and I, I think it's a good game, especially coming from someone who I've I like the Assassin's Creed. Uh, I still like it a little bit, but I've not been following. It. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not going to give Valhalla. Um, at yeah, all. yeah, not a lot of people have, and they're they're kind of tired of empty. Um... Uh, open world games you know a lot of people have just kind of i think the the, the ghost of tishima is like perfectly sized right um yeah and i think a lot of the um a lot of the side stories really tie into your characterization and so so some of the side quests actually just feel like main quests and so i feel compelled to do them whereas like in uh in in assassin's creed some of these side quests just i couldn't care less you know like yeah uh, i can agree with that like and yeah it's kind of a shame but i, I think um, it's like the the incentives are different right so like ubisoft is also one of these companies that popularized the games as a service model right and so mm -hmm. i think one of the metrics they're looking at is like a uh, total play time or, or play time retention right and it, the, the bigger your world is right the larger your world the more stuff there is to do well the longer you know your people are going to be playing the game at least in theory right um and it's more time for you to sell them uh, microtransactions and, and other bullshit that they don't need, right? Yeah. Uh, so, like, Ghost of Tsushima obviously does not have that philosophy, even though it is, I mean, at its core, it feels like a, a Ubisoft-like game. It's more It's more akin to... I, I think the, the, the last tolerable Assassin's Creed was Assassin's Creed Origin, which I actually played a little bit of this year. I've heard it was uh, pretty good, actually. I yeah, haven't given or, or, it a shot yet. Origins is, like, at the borderline of this, like transition period so like i think uh, the last traditional quote-unquote assassin's creed was um syndicate mm -hmm. um which was more in, t in, t in tandem with the old style like so the older assassin's creed games are like more like a sandboxy game mm -hmm. um where you're in a city like one locale maybe two at most uh usually there are buildings around that's like sort of the most distinguishing factors um and it's sort of like you you have you have a sandbox to play with Whereas the new games are like they they are meant to be like Breath of the Wild esque kind of like exploration yeah. games, and I don't really know that Assassin's Creed story is served very well by um, open world settings. Um, it definitely again it benefits that playtime retention metric, which I think is what they're using at, at Ubisoft. I don't exactly know, but I I, I think I heard that from some uh, game uh, analyst. It's for um, sure beyond me. I will I will give that. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, like the 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 the, the philosophies are completely different, right? So, like, while Ghost of Tsushima kind of has a lot of inspirations from Assassin's Creed, um, you don't have uh, these weird like incentives to do, you know, to to push you to do things that are kind of meaningless, yeah. right? Um, and the story, actually, I mean, like, a story alone, I think, is way more cohesive than most Assassin's Creed plots. I think in part because Assassin's Creed was obsessed with doing this. Um, the modern day story, which which mm -hmm. basically died with Desmond back in Assassin's Creed Three or whatever. Actually, uh, that was that was when I stopped the series. I like Three, but I can like if someone told me, yeah, I'm. Not so I I, I I so I, I I preemptively bought like I think the Assassin's Creed pack. I, I think every winter it goes for sale, and it's like really mm -hmm. cheap. It's like less than forty dollars for like seven games. So it's like why That's not? That's not too bad. So I think I had, I bought the pack and I, I felt compelled to play the game. So like I think I um I played Assassin's Creed one through three like oh I, I played those like a, a, for a, a long time ago. Like I think I even I even showed you I got Assassin's Creed three from like 
a Ubisoft rep when he came to my school back when I was in college. Um, so like I, I played the first three when they came out roughly and maybe a year after they came out. And then Assassin's Creed 4, I didn't get around to playing until 2019, like, la- like two years ago. Yeah. And Assassin's Creed 4, I actually think, is is better than 3 um, in, in terms of this old school, like, sandboxy feel. That's what but I've been hearing. For sure. It has it has, a, it has a bit of the open world stuff because you're, you're a pirate and you're kind of going around to different mm-hmm. islands and stuff. But, like, the, the islands are, are kind of tightly knit, knit enough that they feel like a sandbox as opposed to this weird, like, open world, like, you have to go to so every corner of the map kind of feel. Um, so fours, I would recommend U- Unity. Uh, Unity is kind of weird. I think partly because the mechanics changed, but mm-hmm. some people swear to Unity is probably one of the better sandboxy Assassin's Creeds. But I, I think it's sort of up in the air. Uh, and then Syndicate, uh, yeah, Syndicate is just Syndicate's a pass. Origins is is okay. So if you were to play a future Assassin's Creed game, I, I just play four and Origins and kind of leave it at that. Okay. Okay, let me see. What was my last game? I did have one game. I, I think I'm blanking out a little bit. What was my last one? Um, I gotta look at. I I feel like I have to look at my Steam library. Yeah, <laughs> I was looking at some for some honorable mentions. Oh, like... I will talk about this one. This one was actually quite fun. Um, if you want a game that does that is that is a pretty fun cyberpunk game. Or actually, you know what? I will say this. This one, I had a very pleasant surprise. Uh, it's actually Valhalla. I don't know if you've played that, actually. Um, oh, I was thinking of, <laughs> for some reason, I was thinking Brawlhalla. Not, That's pretty terrible. No, I know, no, I, no, you're good. I know, not, not Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I know. But it's basically, it's, it's, it's spelled V-A-11, H-A-11. So Valhalla. So it's basically a cyberpunk bartending game, which is primarily um what is it called it's 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 primarily visual novel based yeah but what's cool is that the the entire game takes place in three locations it's either your apartment you when you buy stuff at the store or the bar and you really find out people's stories through the bar and you find out the main character jill's story as well it's got wonderful music so basically well yeah you're you're just essentially serving these guys alcohol uh, you're getting to know them, and they're they're nicely written. You know, you find out maybe one one person is just tired of being a soldier and just wants to come relax, and and is not really wanting to deal with the world. And then you have another guy who's just a, a plain old sex pig who just acts <laughs> like one. And then you right. find out why he is like that. It's 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 a very well done game, and. Uh, it was I was just very happily surprised, and through that you start to find out the main character's story and what is you know what's her deal, what is going on with her, and it was a fun time. It's definitely a fun game that I would absolutely highly recommend. It's it's wonderful. It's on everything, so oh, cool. it's 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 not hard to find. I think how much is it on Steam? Um, let me see. I think it should be like. Fourteen ninety nine usually, but I mean, what's actually no? I'm sorry, it's on Steam sale for nine eighty nine. Okay, and and it, it's it's a fun game. You can get it on on Switch as well, so it's 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 worth it. Sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. I I really like that game. That was pleasantly surprised. It it came out a couple years back, but I'm just glad to be able to play it this year. Someone gifted but, it to me, so I'm grateful for that. One good cyberpunk game. <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> it, it it's definitely one of those i'll tell you that it's good though any uh honorable mentions for any me honorable... um i will say another cyberpunk game because this one was actually quite good um i did stream for these guys uh it's co- it's a game called cloudpunk i uh, um i it's my wish list i would it's it's recommended for sure yeah it's a um, another, another visual novel too right no actually um, it's more of an explorative world, which okay. which is nice. Um, basically, you're you're kind of a, a courier driver, uh, a driver. It's your first day, and you know the two rules that they that they say that you're not supposed to do is, uh, you know, you c- you cannot say no to a job, and you can you you don't ask what's in the package. Right. That's basically it. And then the whole wor- world kind of delves into there. I only played quite a bit, but it was very very intrigued. 
honestly. I will say that my computer is getting a little older, so it might not be the best to run some of these games. But right. um, when it, from what I did play, it was it was quite fun, and I did have a lovely time with it. So it's it's very highly recommended. I, I think from what it sounds like, we've created quite a good list this year. I think yeah, I think so. I mean, like yeah. pretty pretty solid titles. You can't very go wrong, titles, wrong with any of them. Yeah, and and the nice thing is they're all easily accessible. They're all fun to get into, and I think a wide variety of people will enjoy that for sure. Legitimately looking forward to. It. I might actually go buy um a a legal version of of um of Metal Gear Solid from from GOG because it sounds like I'm, all the support. Because I'm pretty sure my uh, my bootleg copy won't have any controller support at all. No, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's not. Um. If, I downloaded it like years ago too, so I don't even know if I could find it in my hard my hard drive. If if you're really curious, um, what was it called? Uh, I did a port versus port of that. I just released that. So if you want to see like the differences between the original and that, I I would recommend it. And you can see the side by sides. There's quite a lot going on with that. Yeah, I'll I'll actually link it in this video. Honestly, the good thank good, you, man. I appreciate good that. uh good information for anyone watching this video. For those yeah, who stuck, or stuck around for the whole thing. It, it, <laughs> It, it was quite surprising and you know other thing too you know silent hill 4 is also on gog officially so th that's weird but hey uh, that sounds that sounds promising yeah no it's it's i played it a little bit i actually want to do a port for support of that as well it's it's pretty well done from what i know so definitely recommended awesome uh with that i guess we're done unless you have any last words I, I think that's it for me. I think I played as much as I, I, I said as much as I think I did. I hope. Cool. <laughs> I hope no, everyone, should, yeah. I hope everyone listening likes these titles. Uh, if you have your own, you could comment or yeah, leave a comment or just yeah. What do you guys yeah. think? Are like some great games that you know maybe we should have touched upon? We'd love to hear from you. Definitely. With that, guys, I'll see you later. No, no problem. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yep, this has been fun. And uh, next time you do something and you want me on, let me know. I oh, love hell it. yeah. Chat either Nintendo or uh, any other video game stuff. Oh, big, absolutely, man. I'd love to.